Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to SGFC Bank's Annual Analyst Meets 2022. We are ready to begin our first session. For that, I would like to invite Mr. Shashidar Jagdishan, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Kaiser Barucha, Executive Director, and Mr. Srinivasan Vaidyanathan, Chief Financial Officer, to present overview of the bank. Okay, thank you. Uh, should we get started? Yes. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get started now. Good morning to all of them. Uh, we'll have uh, Sashi open and open the conference and talk uh, uh, for some time and, and various topics that he will cover. Uh, at the end of the session, after he is uh, concluded, uh, we'll have enough time for a question and answer session across this room for however long we all want. Uh, so with that, uh, without much ado, uh, Sashi, you want to get yeah. started? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for coming over here. It's such a great pleasure to meet each one of you in person. Uh, sometimes, you know, while Zoom calls are efficient, but uh, it's always a pleasure to meet all of you in flesh and blood, at least once in a way. Uh, I know ever since 4th of April, a lot of questions, <laughs> we have been bombarded with a lot of uh, questions as to what is the rationale for the merger. But uh, before I get on to that, I think let us try and uh, just go through as to what has happened over the last couple of years in a nutshell and where we are positioned both from an economy perspective and also as a bank perspective. <clears throat> I think uh, I must say that when you start to travel, when you start to look at all the economies across the globe, I think India has navigated the pandemic rather well, rather admirably. I think all of you would agree. I'm not an expert, but I think when you compare with all the economic metrics, I think we have done reasonably well. Uh, that's number one. Number two is in March, we were exiting very beautifully, both from an economy perspective and also as a bank, uh, exiting COVID. I think uh, interest rates were reasonably benign. Inflation was benign. I think uh, we were probably on, uh, on a roll as an economy and we had at least projected a 9 plus percentage GDP growth for FI23. But unfortunately, as all of you would know, I think uh, the Ukraine-Russia so-called special operations uh, was a spoiled sport and you started to have a lot of these uh, metrics uh, go awry. But having said that, I think uh, even inflation, inflation probably peaked uh, as we speak in September, in April. Uh, but I think the kind of uh, orchestration between both RBI and, uh, and uh, the Ministry of Finance or the government, I think has been admirable in terms of to see a gentle landing. And we probably would expect the inflation which will come down and then go up to about peak in September and then go back to the pre-COVID levels by March of 23. And that is our expectation with reasonable conservatism of uh, the oil prices here. I think uh, uh, that, 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 is, that is something that we should be extremely happy about. Uh, interest rates, I think uh, the governor probably has explained it so beautifully in his uh, in his remarks, both at the MPC and also in subsequent uh, uh, interactions with the press. I think uh, what we have seen of 40 basis points, maybe another 7,500 basis points is what uh, we probably would uh, expect. But having said that, whether it is the inflation numbers, whether it's the interest rates, whether it's the delta in the interest rates, I think the country has seen it uh, over, over, if you look at the last 10 year history, I think we have uh, seen all these levels before and we have had a reasonably healthy growth rates of about 5 and 8% over the last 10 years. So similarly here too, I think our expectations of about 725 to 7.5% of a GDP growth will still be one of the best uh, globally. And even if uh, for whatever reason oil becomes a bit stubborn and moves to 115 to $120, I think we still will see uh, reasonable amount of growth which will not be uh, visible in any parts of the world. So to that extent, I think from a macro perspective, India is very resilient. So we are in, despite whatever people may say in terms of, you know, some amount of shocks, I 
I do believe that yes, the people, the lower income, the lower mi middle and the lower middle income will get impacted, have got impacted with the kind of high inflation. Uh, you will see some amount of their discretionary spends being postponed. But otherwise, the middle and upper middle income, uh, I think uh, where largely the salary base, we have seen a fair amount of wage inflation to absorb these kind of inflationary uh, impact. I think should continue to be buoyant in terms of spends, in terms of their uh, demands for credit, and that is what is going to be driving the economy. <clears throat> I think India has a lot of levers. Before I just close on the macro side, I think whether it's a China plus one strategy, whether it is the fact that in eight to ten months' time one should, I think you will start to uh, hear this from Kazad and from Rakesh and Nirav later on. The kind of uh, capex, the, the government capital expenditure that is likely to be uh, unveiled in about eight to ten months' time, or <clears throat> even private capex. There are certain sectors which had prior to around February, March, uh, you know, decent amount of people who probably would have uh, put up uh, unveiled uh, private capital uh, capital expenditure drawing plans, but they may be postponing this for a while, but still there is a huge amount which is likely to come up once things become rather normal. So in that context, I think uh, we are probably, uh, India is a great destination to be in. We are privileged to be part of this uh, country um, and more so in financial services. I think a three trillion economy going to a five and seven and eight to 12 years time is something that is uh, very much doable. We are a player on Indian economy. I think there's an echo. There's an echo from that side. <clears throat> Hello. I think we've always been a player on the Indian economy, 60% uh, being consumption whether it's retail or corporate consumption, I think we have been well positioned that. Uh, we're also equally well positioned on the term side or the capital expenditure side and also on the government spending where we are uh, now with a renewed interest getting into the government business as well. So uh, as a company, I think we will be riding this wonderful wave of uh, what India is likely to uh, give us over the next uh, five, ten years. We will be the third largest economy in the world after in the US and Japan. So it's something that uh, we're all eager to be well positioned. You know, when you look at even the other indicators, you look at the, 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 uh, the, the per capita uh, GDP, per GDP on a purchasing parity basis, I think at seven thousand plus dollars, I think we are one of the uh, we are equivalent to probably where U.S. was in 19, 1982. Uh, we are at an inflection point where the demand for consumer durables, the demand for financial pro products, is going to be on the rise. So we are well positioned on that from an economy perspective. Uh, so this is where we are. In addition to that, I think what has changed and what is something added our interest and that is the reason why and I'm sure a lot of people would be <clears throat> uh, waiting to hear as to our thought process, our rationale of the merger. I know we have not gone onto the media uh, too often. Uh, so whilst HDFC Limited has shared their side of the story, I think it's, it's important that you sort of hear our side of the story as well. So let me just uh, tell you a story. I think this was sometime in uh, May of the same time, May of 2021. Uh, I think we had a strategy session in the bank just up post uh, the wave two. And uh, you know, in, we did sort of invite a lot of macro strategists uh, uh, in the meeting. And one of the themes that the macro strategists covered was on the housing sector. All of you probably know this, that uh, the housing sector has been languishing for a long time. And it was not for anything, it is purely from a self-discipline perspective from this builder-developer fraternity. 
I think, you know, all of us have been victims of that where we realize that, uh, you know, projects used to get hugely delayed. The delivery of uh, homes used to get anywhere between six, eight, ten years. So this was a kind of a melee which was there in the system and the people really, citizens got a bit uh, disenchanted about it. But then one of the best regulations that could come about during in our post 75 years of independence was a RERA Act. And I think that was a clinching, that was a game changer. Uh, all of us know that, that this particular act had a lot of teeth and therefore you had um, some amount of a fear psychosis in this particular fraternity. <clears throat> At the same time, in 2014, the Reserve Bank of India started the, the asset quality review of banks. Then you had the ILFS issue, the asset quality uh, reviews spilled over to the, uh, to the NBFCs as well. I think a combination of the asset quality review, a combination of what happened in RERA, I think strangulated these uh, developers and the builder fraternity where one needed to ensure that you had huge amount of financial discipline as one would expect any other entity to be. In. So that was a game changer. That sort of changed the entire thought process, etc. The builders had nowhere to go. They had to drop their prices by about 20-25%. You started to see as we were entering COVID, apart from bankers, apart from Capital markets, I think the only other sector which had a lot of buoyancy during the start of the pandemic was housing sales and you started to see that going on an upsurge. So the, by the time in March 20 to June 20, you started to see the financial balance sheets of developers become better. Two, the inventory levels came down from a 16 month to a 20, 30 month. Three, most important, the affordability. I think <clears throat> with wage inflation for over the last eight years, the affordability of end consumer was huge. In a take home pay of rupees 100, the home loan EMI used to be about 50 rupees. But now it has, to come, it has come down to about 20, 23 rupees. That is what the, the macro strategist had told us in our presentation. In addition to that, thanks to media, thanks to internet, thanks to communication, the aspiration levels of people to have a decent home really has gone up tremendously. No more is it restricted in the top 100 towns of the country. But now as you go down to the tier 3, tier 4, tier 5, tier 6, whether it is a Palampur, whether it is Jogindranagar, whether it is uh, Manali, whether it is even, uh, you know, even beyond, whether it is Haldwani, you will see the demand for good homes taking a kind of a geometric progression. You know, the estimate that people, the experts have uh, put in is 2.5 billion home loans, uh, 2.5 billion square foot of home space. That is a kind of uh, demand that is there going to be from the uh, housing sector. And this is going to power Indian economy in addition to whatever I've just said over the next five to seven years. So when this was presented and when we realized that where are we in this particular space, it was a bit of a shocker because here we have one of the largest distribution the macro is telling a lot of things which is going to be powering Indian economy and we are, we, we have always waxed eloquent on having a great arrangement with HDFC Limited in terms of distribution of home loans. But what happened? <clears throat> we were not there anymore. We were, we were probably, you know, all along in these 27 years we never realized it, A, because the sector was languishing and we had lots of things to grow. We had our plates full. Not that we didn't have our plates full, we still have our plates full. X mortgages, we have a runway over the next 20, 30 years. No problems at all from a growth perspective. But when you see another sector which can overlay on whatever we are trying to do and we are not there in its truest sense, 
because there are a lot of others who are doing three to four times the distribution with a, it, it became a bit of a shocker for us. Then our young uh, CFO had presented in the same forum that uh, where do we stand on this? He made a lot of revelations, he and his team, uh, to all of us. I'm, I'm not too sure whether the leadership team is aware, but he did. <clears throat> Number one is, we realized that out of our 70 million odd customers, only 2% of our customers had an HDFC home loan. That itself was a shocker, because when you look at some of the uh, presentations as we go by, you had credit card penetration which was in the 20s, you had the unsecured penetration which was in the uh, teens, you had um, uh, vehicle loans in about 6 percent but uh, the uh, home loan was just 2 percent. Uh, that was very surprising. Uh, then he made another revelation. He said that look, Whilst two percent have taken loans, there are five percent of your customers who have taken loans, home loans, from smattering of a lot of other banks, and this cluster of five percent is equivalent to another HDFC retail bank, and that was a shocker. That sort of really sort of uh, uh, you know made me sit to say that look, what are we missing? Why is it that we are not really? selling home loans the way that we are supposed to do, considering the fact it's a very emotional product. So when you peel the onions and go down, then you realize the ground reality. See, if you take any product for us, we have uh, over a period of time, whatever products we have manufactured, whether it's unsecured, whether it's credit cards, whether it's vehicle loans, whether it's when I say vehicle means auto, two-wheeler, loan against property, and you name it, your merchant loans, as a case may be. We have a lot of analysis about a customer. And we have enabled our frontline staff with tools, thanks to analytics powered by AI and AML, where we will know the propensity of a product that a customer is likely to take. And we also now have the ability to have the right narrative to even go behind this particular script. Now, <clears throat> when you have that kind of a tool enabled in front of you, you know, these are all youngsters, the age of 23 to 30 at the front end. They have a lot of confidence in engaging with the customer. You know, if someone comes in and says that I need a car or I need a home loan or a personal loan, the confidence at which he or she talks is, is immense. There is a, a, you know, they would like to talk about something which they can suppose he has been searching for an auto loan in the web and we get to know that. You know, the confidence that your uh, 20 and a 30 year old has in front to talk to a customer saying that, sir, I believe you're searching for a car. You, we, we have an approved loan, uh, uh, a pre-approved uh, sanction of a car loan for about 20, 30 lakhs. So as a case, maybe look at the confidence that the youngster will have, and and we, you can get take it in 10 seconds. We have, as one would see in the presentations in the future, you can see it in the website. We have a huge amount of pre-approved offers for all our manufactured products, and that is visible to the front end. When it came to a home loan, unfortunately, because it's a different organization altogether, we don't have that visibility. The frontline people don't have that visibility. The customer walks in, he applies for a home loan, we just scan it and send it to HTFC Limited. In fact, the average turnaround time is about eight to 10 days. In fact, when we, were, I, we just returned from uh, it, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand and I was very surprised in some of the locations it was even 15 days and there was a request whether you can cut it down to six to seven days. So this is ground reality and when you have an average turnaround time of eight to ten days or even 15 days in this day and age and era you know people are not going to really wait for this long unless and until they love your brand so much. That explains why 5% of our customers took home loans from outside. And that is reality. And they had their own compulsion. There's no, there's no fault of anybody out here. Because, and I'll explain to you, and when you ask questions as to why is it that we did not resolve this, 
because ultimately you know when you look at we had 6300 plus branches there is just about they had only 600 branches. So obviously the distance between the two is only limited and you know, you know when you have such wave thin distribution from NHGFC limited therefore the turnaround time would be longer and they had their own compulsions as to why they did not expand their distribution and we will talk about it. So this is ground reality in the sense that you know the macro is screaming that housing sector is going to be powering India's GDP over the next 5-7 years. You had one of the best products which is HDFC home loan. We have not harnessed our customer base, we have not harnessed our channels, our distribution strength. So this is something was quite uh, counterintuitive for us. So we said that look and I remember this the word that he used was we are going to be missing out as an opportunity and that is what he uh, presented to all of us uh, way back in May 2021. <clears throat> there were two things number one we go back to HDFC limited and then probably ask as to how we can repair this or we have to think of something else. Now the other aspect was can we merge? This is uh, I remember the last time we did this exercise was in 2014 and we had the model and uh, it did not make economic sense at that point in time and I will explain that to you as well. So he used the same model from May of 2021 and probably worked on it along with this team and sometime around October he came back to me to say that look um, you know contrary to your expectation that uh, you were not too sure whether it will work but it seems to be ticking all the right boxes. So I was a bit surprised, we were all a bit surprised saying that how is that possible? Obviously a lot of things had changed from 2014 and what were they? In 2014 the balance sheet of HDFC limited is about 300,000 crores out of which 2.25 lakh crores was uh, retail and the 70, 75,000 crores was non-retail. We had uh, so on a 300,000 crore balance sheet the regulatory threshold for SLR and CR was about 26, 27 percent, 26 percent probably. So you take say approximately 30 percent on 3 lakh so somewhere between 80 to 90,000 crores was the requirement of uh, requirement of uh, SLR and CR. Now what is the way? We had to raise incremental funds and then put it in GSEX for about 80 to 90,000 crores. At that point in time the bank's capability or capacity was about 60 to 70,000 crores of liabilities in a year. Just imagine to do another 80 to 90,000 crores of taking liabilities and putting in government securities which is a tall order. Also the priority sector requirements, a 3 lakh crore adjusted for whatever uh, 40 percent was the uh, requirement. You had a lot of exemptions and net of that again it came to about 80 to 90,000 crores. Another 80 to 90,000 crores I had to raise deposits and put it either in PSL assets or in rural infrastructure development funds. So combined basis the requirement was 80 plus 80 about roughly 160,000 crores of liabilities that we had to raise and put it into either government securities or in priority sector assets. This is a tall order for an engine which is doing 60 to 70,000 crores of liabilities. I think respectfully both in leadership teams I think said it was not making sense so let us uh, shelve it till it made economic sense, <clears throat> till the regulations change. So we moved on, a lot of you you know kept on asking and I think we sort of uh, did explain this eight years ago. Or Come now uh, in the last eight years a lot of things have changed. The regulatory threshold itself has come down from 26 percent to 22 percent. Two is 
large NPFCs, thanks to the ILFS issues, the D Devan housing issues, I think the regulator rightfully put in the liquidity coverage requirements on large NBFCs. <coughs> so, eight years ago, HDFC limited at 4,000 crores of government securities. Now, they had 40,000 to 50,000 crores of government securities. Right from October 2017, the bank ourselves have been maintaining excess SLR beyond our requirements. That is something that we have consistently been doing this. So when you really look at the requirement today, they have a 5, five lakh crore balance sheet or a 4 lakh crore liability. When you look at the requirement of SLR and CRR, less of all the exemptions that they can, it's roughly about 70 or 1,000 crores. So today, there is an excess with him. There is an excess with us. We believe that at no point in time would we want to, do we need to raise incremental liabilities to be put in government securities because we have excesses out here. So this is the one part of it which is very clear. Then came, comes the priority sector. When you look at the priority sector requirements, that has not changed. That's still about 40% of the total balance sheet, which is roughly <clears throat> around 150,000, 160,000 crores, Shini? Yeah. So yeah, here it is, uh, 175,000 crores. Now, you know, there have been a lot of innovations in the recent, in the last eight years. One of the best innovations that uh, one could think of is the priority sector lending certificates, where people with excesses uh, sell their ex uh, priority sector for a fee. Uh, and it's a screen-based trading, and people with shortfall buy it for a cost. So to, at least now you don't have the, the kind of uh, 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 drag to raise incremental liabilities further to put it in priority sector, at least 50% of that, because the market is about 6 lakh crores and it's growing about 10 to 15%. So at least 50% of uh, what uh, we are likely to uh, need will be out of the priority sector certificates. The balance 50%, which is about 80 or 90,000 crores, which is out here, is, is something that we have 33 months from today. 18 months for the approval is the approximate time. And then another 30 months from the date of the effective date of approval. So we have enough time to sort of generate liabilities in any form and then put it either in priority sector assets or even in rural infrastructure development bonds. So when you look at the entire, um, the, uh, the, what is required now from a regulatory perspective is much, much, much smaller than what we felt eight years ago. The last, but the most important thing is on the purchase consideration itself. <clears throat> HDFC Limited eight years ago used to be priced six times book. Their share price was about 1.3 times out of HDFC Bank. Today, it is about 0.8 times that of HDFC Bank. So the purchase consideration has come off significantly. And they are about three and a half times very similar to that of HDFC Bank. So what happened was, what happens is when you take that $40 billion as a net capital into net assets into your balance sheet on the merger, the, there will be a day zero dip in return on capital or return on equity. But you have within, because the purchase consideration is much lesser now, the ROEs within the four to five years time, it comes back to your pre-merger ROEs. And that is what we realize at the normal growth rate that we are talking about. The return on asset he is one of the few housing finance companies which had a return on asset of 2 plus percentage. So from an ROA perspective, it's not dilutive at all. From an EPS and a book value share, because there's going to be a cancellation of the 21% that he's holding in us, which is now inhibited with a holding whole code discount, it'll suddenly be accretive for, from an earnings per share and a book value per share. So when you see all these metrics, when you see, so 
what are we trying to see? There's a macro which is screaming that this is going to be a sector you cannot miss. You have to be there. It's a great opportunity overlaying on otherwise uh, whatever we have, we have been doing for 27 years. Two, the micro, uh, uh, all the micro indicators suggest that the task of raising liabilities is to that extent much lesser. The financial parameters are positive. So why don't we then start and talk to them? So this is sometime in October or November of uh, 2021. We made the first pitch. So, you know, contrary to belief, we batted on the front foot. Normally for 25 years, we were always on the back foot to say that, hey, we are not too keen or whether um, we're not too sure about it. But this time around, we went on the front foot saying that we won this merger. So this is sometime in October. We came back uh, after mulling it over uh, by about February end or so. And I think uh, we said that, look, I think if you're keen, let's execute it as quickly as possible. And that's how, you know, March and April, I think we really uh, concluded on a lot of these things. So here is, you know, our side of the story where we believe that it's a scale opportunity for us. Here is a one in a lifetime opportunity for the organization to, to double every five years. That's the kind of an opportunity we're looking out for. Uh, overlaying and all the underlying. So if the organization had a visibility of 30, 20, 30 years of runway, I think you will be surprised that we will have a runway of 50 to 100 years. So this is going to be a durable organization. Look at the benefits that's going to accrue for this. Number one, a home loan is a very emotional and a sticky product. Anyone who is wanting a home loan for self-consumption is going to ensure that they would not like to default. That's the mindset. So he or she is likely to maintain better balances to ensure that they, when the EMIs come in, it does not bounce. And you look at the track record, the 2% of the home loans, which were sold in HDFC home loan, the 2% of the 70 million base, which were sold a HDFC home loan, had balances, which is about five to seven times the normal average balances. That's the kind of liability potential that is there when you cross sell a home loan. <clears throat> the second one, for every home loan, every home loan, people would want new furnitures, new kitchenette, new consumer durables. We are the largest consumer durable bank outside of Bajaj Finance. And here is an opportunity for us to bundle this product along with every home loan that we sell. So look at the bundling opportunity that will emanate out of this particular uh, one particular product. The third one, for 27 years, I think the bank, its great architecture has excelled in its unsecured lending. When you look at uh, whether it's corporate, whether it is SME, whether it is retail, we have one of the best ex well-executed unsecured portfolios ever, even including globally as well. Our proportion is 35% of our total advances is unsecured. Now, whether it is the leadership team out here, whether it is the board, whether it's regulator, all of us will have a little bit of a jitter when it comes to, yo, know, is it, uh, yeah, it's a bit high risk and it is large. So whilst we are very comfortable all this while, but there will be always this inhibition in our minds. But just imagine how this would change the game when you have the, the uh, this proportion, it'll come down to a 20-25% and that is the kind of runway that we have. We will have even an unsecured because it's our marquee product, we have done it so well. Look at the opportunity that will have uh, multiple opportunities when you sell a home loan. A, growth, B, liability franchise, cross-selling opportunity and a further runway for our unsecured products as well. So when you started to think through, I think here is an opportunity, and I, I normally don't sort of uh, provide any guidance. Now today, on the day, effective date, we will be six to seven billion dollars of 
profits that gets accrued on an annual basis. In five years time, you look at the math, you, you work out in terms of the reasonable growth of between 18 and 22 percent, anywhere between that, you will come to a 14 to 15 billion dollar of uh, profits. That's the kind of scale we're talking about. This is going to be a scale opportunity. So I think, uh, let me pause out here. This is our rationale on this. I think the bank has adequate enough avenues. Growth is not going to be an opportunity, is not going to be an issue at all. It's going to be pouring out of our years. I think the only limiting factor is going to be liabilities. And I will explain to you the strategy as to what we're trying to do on the liabilities part of it. But as of now, let me pause out here and take any questions. Mike, if you have a mic, please. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so you said that the bank will double balance sheet every five years, yeah. which will be on a merged basis as well. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and of course, you will explain on the liability front, but uh, you know, growing so fast on a merged balance sheet. Uh, Will you be able to garner so much liability? Yeah, here? good question. So as you can see that particular chart out here, you know, it, it, this is not new for us. Time and again, right from 2012, all of you have been, even when we did the Centurion merger, all of you have been asking whether we will be in a position to grow. When you look at the our track record over the last you know, whether it was between 2012 and 17 or 2017 to 22, we have grown more than 2. Point, how many times? 2.4 times, 2.4 times, which means that we have probably, you know, double less than five years. Okay. So uh, size is not a matter at all for us. It's not because we have the runway. Let's face it. We are just as 11.5% uh, um, of the total banking system. Even after merger will be about 15% of the system. It's not about the size. It's about A, do you have the distribution? We have the distribution. B, we have multiple channels. We have an alternate banking channel, which is going to be covering the various other aspects of it. It's going to be a kind of an octopus kind of uh, approach, hub and spoke, which will ensure that wherever the branches are not there, you will have the business correspondence and the business facilitators trying to get it. We have, you know, the other aspect of it is the capital. We have enough capital now. We have capital enough for growth. We don't need capital all the way until 2030, probably. Uh, our, all our franchises, all our franchises, whether it's corporate, whether it's SME, whether it is uh, retail, all of them are firing on all fronts. Our asset quality, our book is extremely good. But you're right. One of the most important aspects and the levers for growth is liabilities. What are we trying to do? We are going to be virtually creating something very uh, Teutonic, and that is we're going to be adding about 1,500 to 2,000 branches a year for the next three years. It's going to be a tall order, but we are go virtually going to be doubling our distribution from now to then. It's important. You know, here is an opportunity, and why not? And even you really look at it, the branch is an extremely important uh, fulcrum for garnering deposits. When you look at the, you know, the vintage of our branches, of our 6,300 branches, and when you see the 0 to 5, the vintages which are 0 to 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, and greater than 15, if in if branches in the 0 to 5 are generating X amount of liabilities, in a 5 to 10, it'll be 3X. In a greater than 10X, uh, greater than 10, it'll be a 10X. And greater than 15, it'll be probably 25X. And that is what it shows out here. So we have a fair amount of vintage, which is less than 5 years. 60% of our branches are in the less than 10 years. So look at as it migrates to the higher vintage, look at the kind of potential that's going to be there in terms of deposit mobilization. So 
one of the most important aspects of it is that we will be trying to ensure that we add more and more distribution points and you will fundamentally have another question and I am trying to preempt that that in this age of uh, in this age of uh, uh, digital era is it appropriate to add branches frankly India's demography is different than anyone else anywhere else you know we are today the average distance of a branch is about six to seven kilometers even within our own and all of us in this room we all agree that we don't travel five to seven kilometers to go to a branch it's it's a quite a tall order we want the concentration to come down so the you have enough room to expand in fact uh, there is a huge amount of a liability pod available in the semi urban and rural we have reorganized our branch banking recently to tap into that to have a separate vision on the rural and semi urban because ultimately you know the if you look at the credit deposit ratio it's 30 percent there which means that there's a huge amount of liability pod we didn't want to confuse with the overall branch banking we wanted to have a separate vision and that is the reason why we're going to be focusing on liabilities through this uh, new uh, uh, carving out of the organization within branch banking the second aspect of it apart from expanding our distribution we are going to be you know when you look at the 70 million customer base our penetration levels on time deposits is very limited it's just about 14 odd percent now you may wonder as to why is it that we have not done it see when you look at our track record all these years we have had enough funding just to take care of our growth you take an FI 21 we grew incrementally 100,000 plus crores of uh, assets we had 100,000 crores plus of granular liabilities uh, during that period in FI 22 we grew 200,000 crores of assets and we had 200,000 crores of granular liabilities. So the bank and the engine and the machinery has the ability to raise liabilities to the extent that it requires, no problems. Now I know this is important, this is something very important from a leadership perspective and this is one of the things that we discuss very intensely uh, within our own uh, com uh, asset liability committee meetings. Uh, so you will be surprised that we will be pushing up this liability engine now we will try and demonstrate it may not be now but maybe in the coming quarters you will start to already start to see the the liability is growing faster than the assets and that is a kind of uh, objective which is on us it's see when you have growth staring at us when you have growth opportunities pouring out of your ears we will do whatever that is required we are after all an execution engine we have done it admirably over the last 27 years and I don't see any reason why we will not be able to raise incremental liabilities to fund this kind of a growth. So does it automatically mean that in a tight interest rate environment you would see ADFC bank taking the lead in hiking savings rate? Or no, 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 number one we are we have never sort of been on an outlier on rates I think we have managed this by being on par with some of the larger banks and we will continue to do so it's not about you know raising that extra liability rate to get that deposits that's not we're not going to do that we can afford to do that as well and let me explain that later the reality is that uh, you know our sales process at the front end has not been uh, used to asking for liabilities asking for time deposits so it's a new ask it's going to be part of the scorecard hopefully and you know the moment you have the leadership team uh, you know driving each of the leadership teams whether it is the branch whether it's on the virtual relationship management programs whether it's on the other alternate channels whether it's uh, the MSME businesses doing a self-funding whether it's corporate side now raising liabilities to fund their assets uh, we you know the, the moment it becomes a part of a focus a key objectives willy-nilly nine out of ten times we have always met it so this is going to be a, a challenge this is going to be our execution responsibility on part of the leadership team 
and that is what we're going to be doing that. So we're not going to be changing rates, we're not going to be spoiling rates, we're going to be just using the same rate structure that is there in the market. Sure it will go up but so with the yields. So we will be focusing on just ensuring that our sales process ensures that we start to ask and have the penetration move from a from a 14 percent to a larger number. Mind you look at the kind of scale that will happen. A one percentage swing from a 14 to a 15 percent you know will generate a five to six billion dollars of additional liabilities. That's the kind of swing we are talking about. So when you start to go down to the at the grassroots level when you start to have you know people with the kind of a metric to say that look you need to have a target from 14 to a 16 to 18 to a 20 as a case maybe over the next three years frankly it's no sweat and we are very confident that we'll be able to absorb the liability, the, the growth. And you wouldn't have any CASA ratio in mind right it's <coughs> maybe an outcome. See I mean if your CASA ratio let me let me you know if you look at our long term average all these years our CASA ratio has been in a range of 40 to 41 percent. In the recent past we have been about 45, 47 percent. It's an aberration, it's an outlier. Why? Whilst the CASA has grown about 24, 25 percent your time deposits have grown only 7 percent. But why? Because we did not need it. We were comfortable with the kind of growth to absorb the kind of growth. So therefore you had an unusually high CASA ratio but in reality when you go down to the uh, to, uh, to, uh, um, to, to a long term average it's about 40, 41 percent. So pushing term liabilities granular time we are not talking about you know a million dollar kind of a we are wanting 0.5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 15 lakhs, 20 lakh deposits these are granular deposits which are not rate sensitive. So even if it comes down to a 40, 41 percent it will still be well within and you may say that it will sort of increase your cost of funds. Look at it HDFC limited has a I think about 580 basis points cost of funds. We have about 360 odd basis point, uh, 360 basis points 3.6 percent cost of funds. There is a 220 basis point cost differential that will accrue to us over a period of time as and when the liabilities mature. I think uh, yeah there it is 220 basis points. So even if I were to shave off some what people have to understand is the 2 plus percentage ROA will be a 3 plus percentage ROA. I am okay even if you shave off 120 basis point but look at the opportunity here it's scale and it's going to be positive ROA accretive. So that's the kind of differential that we're talking about. It's going to be a, a win-win for us. So we are not too overtly concerned if we are pushing term liabilities to sort of get us the liabilities going forward. Got it. Thanks so much and thank you for the waterfall on priority sector because right. I think that's, that's a confusion. I just have one last question. How would you measure customer service? And it is an important one. I mean I, I, I think uh, let me sort of uh, one of the priorities of the organization you know as I said uh, we are an organization which uh, is an execution engine. I think growth is not an issue at all. You know when you start to meet our leadership team today you will be amazed the kind of uh, uh, you know all of them would be sort of demonstrating and I have no visibility of that but each one of them you know you will be surprised with the kind of potential and the runway that they are going to be laying out in front of you. I think it is a lot of energy and the leadership energy travels all the way four levels below and that is something it is a, it's a kind of a uh, you know uh, it is an amazing engine which we have all inherited. I think kudos to the founding uh, team of 27 years who have really built this of course uh, with, with Mr. Puri they helped to, to create this kind of an institution and engine. Having said that uh, one of the four or five priorities that we have is on culture. You know I am not when I go down and it is a reality that I keep going down a lot of these people also go down. I don't need to teach them strategy at all. They'll teach it too. 
the youngsters will teach you two of what's required for growth. They're amazing people, a lot of energy out there. But what we are focusing on is culture, the employee culture. Out of the 141,000 people, there is uh, 127,000 people who are the army. So effectively 13 to 14,000 people are the, the supervisory architecture right from us going down to probably the branch manager, etc. They are the supervisors. One of the things that we are tasking them is on employee culture. That is, you, you create a kind of an environment where you handle people at the ground level. You don't sort of use toxic language. You don't use, uh, uh, you, you're not firing and hiring people just because he, is, he or she has not met performance. It's going to be a, a tough one. It's going to be, it will take a lot of time, but that is a kind of culture we're now trying to nurture all along where people are saying, if there is a problem, handle them, you know, sit with them. It's proven that if a supervisor sits with the youngster for two full working days and demonstrate how to do his or her job, it's a sea change for that individual for his entire life. It has happened to me. It has happened to me as a junior way back. And I believe that all of us have a responsibility if we become successful that we need to have a similar kind of a thought process to our juniors, nurture, care, handhold. And that is a team that we're working on. We're not there, but we will be relentless at that. So giving respect to the individuals is extremely important. When I say individuals, it means the army of the, the youngsters. Why? When you give respect, you get respect twice over. And this is not just for us, even to the consumers, for the customers. And that is the second aspect which we are driving this relentlessly. We are not perfect. We are not there at all as yet. We still have complaints that is coming to me, coming to all of us. When you see the annual report, surely this time around, I'm sure the complaints have come down by a 20, 30 percent. It's not something that we are still happy with. We want to be, uh, you know, go down to a level where we can say that hey, we are rid of that particular kind of uh, where we need to. So what are we trying to do? Here, what does the customer want? The customer wants respect. And what does respect translate to in terms of speed of reaction? So whether it's a query, whether it's an instruction, whether it is a financial need, whether it's a complaint, how diligent and how speedily do we go back to the customer? This is all we want to measure, as I said, we are putting our best foot forward on this across all. I think as and when we, uh, and we have a lot of metrics. We have a net promoter score, which I'm sure we will be publishing in our annual report this time around, I hope. Uh, uh, otherwise, it will be on the website for sure. Uh, or maybe during the course of the presentation today, when you're dealing with our marketing team and our branch banking team, I think they, that'll come up. And that's the leadership team out there does it very passionately and it is something that we go back to the detractors. Every customer who's not happy, we, there is now almost a 99% uh, turnaround in terms of going and the seniors going and talking to these uh, detractors to say, sir, what have you done wrong? And it's uh, in really nearly always something that we have goofed up. So we have a lot to do. We have a lot to do in terms of process changes. We have a lot of things that we're doing in terms of how to make instruction self-service. A lot of things are there when you start to talk to the, the, the technology teams and digital teams and the branch teams and a lot of other teams. Every, every aspect of it, we are trying to see how we can minimize touch, minimize uh, paper. You know, we are running with a, a theme called zero touch, zero paper. And when you uh, you know, you'll be, you'll be amazed to know the person driving that will be the head of operations out here. And when you hear his presentation and when you, I'm sure you'll be amazed to know that how come, you know, where we are trying to move people to the front end, have lesser people at the back end. And this, this is the theme that we're talking about. A, it will have a huge impact on customer service. But it's, it's something that's a journey we've commenced. We are relentless about it. It's all about culture. It's all about focus. I think uh, 
I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, over the next uh, three years we should see a dramatic change in the way a consumer perceives us uh, as a bank. I know there's a perception that we are more sales focused, sales oriented, but we are not trying to shrug that off. We want to be more a service first culture organization and that is what we are uh, aiming towards over the next many years. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, sorry. Hi. Hi, Sachi. And thanks for the presentation. A uh, few questions. First, uh, you mentioned that your market share in deposits is going up from 14 to 15. It's not a big deal. But when you look at from a... a when not a market share. That's the penetration. penetration. Okay. But irrespective of the market share, uh, when you look at the total liabilities of the incremental liabilities in the system, you would require almost 20 to 25 percent of the incremental liabilities when you do the merge numbers, right? And, and it's a big task from a, for a franchise like us. So how do you, and, and from a management bandwidth perspective, obviously there would be for few products that may lose uh, uh, from a, maybe from a focus perspective, right? Considering the liability will be the key focus area from the management perspective. So how do you look at this entire situation playing out? That's the first part. Second part is, uh, your overall uh, way you are likely to grow branches, it will have some impact on your cost to income ratio and by when do you see he, those ratios stabilizing. Yeah. Uh, and the third one is the net worth. After the merger, your net worth within a year's time will be bigger than the largest bank in the country. Largely, right? And, and it puts a lot of pressure on you to do, indirectly a kind of pressure on you to do, participate more on the corporate lending business. So. Uh, uh, how do you see the mix shaping up from an next four to five years perspective? Sure. When you look at uh, in terms of market share gain, and I think you are seeing this in front of you, whether you take a one year horizon, whether you take a two year horizon, whether you take a three year horizon, whether you take a five year horizon, I think silently we have demonstrated that the gains that we have had over these, these various time zones has been much more than the cumulative of all your three top peers put together. I think that tells us that when you need to, you know, uh, when there is an opportunity out here, when you are trying to put your machinery in place to garner that, gaining market share faster than anyone else is not an issue thus far. I and mean, this sort of demonstrates that we have executed. And obviously beyond that, all I can tell you is that after all we are an execution engine and we will continue to sort of drive this uh, because it's going to meet our objectives. The second question, sorry. Cost, Cost to income. income. You know, prior to COVID, we were around the 38, 39% cost to earnings. Uh, during COVID, we pull back retail, which is a large cost center. So it went down to a 36, 37%. We are now coming out of COVID. You will start to see it where retail is now starting to increase its dispersals. So all the associated costs, whether it is on the acquisition side, whether it's on the, on the risk side, whether it's on the uh, credit side, all of them will start to fire. So you will start to go back to normalized levels of 38, 39% even without any further investments. I, we are very clear that our investments in technology, our investments in distribution, our investments in people is going to be continuing over a period of time. Even if it were to shave off a little bit of our profitability in the near term, so be it. We're okay, but you'll be surprised that the operating leverage will continue, is kicking in, will continue to kick in. So all things remaining same, you will start to see over the next three to five years, the, the cost to earnings coming back X mortgages. I'm not even talking about mortgages. It'll come down to the mid levels, mid thirties. You know that HDFC limited has runs its shops so beautifully. It has, probably globally one of the best cost of operations less than 10%. So when you do a pure math, our cost to earnings will be somewhere around the 32%.
and when the operating leverage starts to kick in it will go to less than 30 percent. So despite increase in investments in distribution in technology and people you will start to see the cost of earnings going down because the jaws are going to open. We are as I said when I am trying to say that this is going to be a scale game your revenues are going to be virtually doubling. Your cost is not going to go to that extent. So you will see the jaws opening and you will start to see the, the so called cost of earnings coming down dramatically to less than 30 percent. <clears throat> the net worth considering you will be amongst the will you will be the leader I know it is a problem. So, yeah I mean uh, you know he will be the most happiest he he's, he is singing away Kaisab normally does not sing but he, he will he will he will be the most happiest because he has now as it is uh, out of limits and that is a positive I am sorry I missed that particular opportunity the opportunity and you know I, I want to address this once for all you know people the corporate business is as profitable as the SMA business or the retail business. You know it is a 2 plus percentage ROA with an 18 to 20 percent ROA otherwise they do not do this business. The, the only difference is in a corporate business the spreads are small, the cost is also small, the credit cost is also small. So you will have a 2 plus percentage ROA. In a retail business or an SME business the spreads are larger, the cost is larger, the credit cost is larger through the life cycle. So it is a 2 plus percent when you do the DuPont analysis it is a 2 plus percentage ROA. So we do not run businesses which are less than a 2 plus percentage or a, which does not give the 18 to 20 percent ROE in its full capacity. So I want to get that right. So if for whatever reason in the last two years when we have expanded our wholesale or the corporate book to 56 percent where it used to be always about uh, 40 yeah look at this you know you always had the corporate around the 45 46 percent and you know we had a once in a lifetime opportunity to be the preferred banker on the corporate side which Kazar and team will sort of talk about it in their presentations you know we grabbed it with both our hands why should we just because if the NII the net interest margin the weighted average will go down uh, vis a vis a previous year so it sort of slows down to NII growth or this it is just optics it is a timing difference but ultimately it is a 2 plus percentage ROA which is there I mean uh, uh, or uh, uh, that, that is what it matters. So we are not apologetic at all about uh, the proportion of corporate going. But having said that at some point in time I know when retail will start to kick in and the more the sort of mix changes you will start to get uh, the all these things. But you are right with that kind of a network the ability for the corporate franchise to even spearhead growth and be well positioned especially uh, when the government capital expenditure is unveiled say 8 to 9 months or 8 to 10 months hopefully. Uh, uh, you know and you, you probably will hear from Kaiser and Rakesh when they start to talk about what are the plans that the government has you will be amazed we will have a wonderful runway on that aspect. And just two last questions uh, one is on this uh, uh, affordable uh, your priority sector which you plan to grow organically of around 80,000 to 90,000 crores by the time the first PSLC post merger will kick in for you. Uh, what would be the strategy to garner that which all products would you be focusing see, on? See one of the things that uh, it is a focus area obviously today what are we trying to do we have our uh, if you look at the total priority sector none of the institutions have actually defaulted on overall priority sector we have managed it. Out of the 40 percent I think we are now in the early 30s in terms of our core priority sector origination. And uh, the very fact that when you look at the CRB presentations you will be surprised to say that the kind of granular focus they are going to be having. They are going to be having in terms of going, that, going to each and every village, each and every district that is where priority sector is going to be. So we are going to have a separate focus on that. 
what people and when you hear the retail part of it and the branch banking part of it you will also be surprised that by end of this month all our branches will be able to sell gold loans. So this is another avenue of growth and other avenue of priority sector as well because see ultimately when you are trying to look at marginal customers where our credit architecture is not so comfortable. I know our chief credit officer has been trying to text me to say that we have not sort of picked it up but it's just a matter of time you will start to see that we are not talking about anything overnight but over the next three years you are putting all levers to ensure that that uh, uh, whether it is in the form of small and marginal farmer agri whether it is if the credit is not comfortable then give a gold loan where the end use is agriculture. So this is going to be another big lever for us and last but not least the home loan itself. When you see, sell a home loan in a Palanpur or a Jogindranagar or a Haldwani where the ticket size is less than 25 lakhs or 35 lakhs is the case maybe all that classifies and qualifies for priority sector. So our objective over the next three years is whilst growth we, you will see a lot of growth coming in from outside of the metropolitan locations which will qualify as priority sector even for home loans. So we will have enough to sell it is not that uh, we will be entirely self sufficient we will have to sort of buy PSL but the cost which we are now estimating about 1 to 1 and a half percent of our total priority sector requirements may come down because we will be selling this excess PSL as well. So we are not to see we have run it this is a part of embedded in a business model even today. Today also I am we are not self sufficient completely. So there is a kind of a cost that is already embedded in the part of the business model. So going forward also I mean whilst we are putting in all levers to try and see how we can do core priority sector but it is something that we will manage and we will we are anticipating in our growth when I said that we are going to be doubling in about 5 years time the cost of uh, priority sector we have factored that in as well. And last question is by how soon do you expect that the HDFC team will be able to do the home loan business from all our branches currently obviously there is an overlap of maybe around 2000 branches if I am not wrong. Yeah. So for six <coughs> and a half thousand branches for them to do the business interest of so four and a half thousand branches. We have to respect the regulatory approvals uh, the first set of approvals should come in by September October around the competition commission of India is extremely important we will do that. But uh, when you start to hear our head of retail assets he, we are in conversation with HDFC limited to slowly start to you know the ideologies to converge the policies to converge you know it is not so great I mean for example uh, today they may have that they may not provide or they may not take collateral outside of municipality limits. But look here we run loan against property across all our branches and we have that kind of an expertise. We are not asking to go down the risk ladder at all all we now thanks to digital India today you know and I sort of saw it in front of it in a, B, in a BC in a place called Chom through about 40 kilometers or 50 kilometers outside of uh, Palanpur and you go to that BC point and you are surprised to see that when you try and see this is the land is it vacant or hypothecated you will be you will you can get that this is hypothecated to PNB. This is a kind of uh, ability that India has we have all our land records which is uh, uh, you know more or less digitized even if it is not digitized it is a registered mortgage in the Tessil Das uh, records. So the in the last couple of trips that I have gone along with HDFC limited they are reasonably sanguine that these are all doable they would like to now you know go back to the drawing board to think and change. So the objective is once we get our the fundamental approvals in place especially the competition commission you will start to see opening up of our distribution more and more now it is about 2000 branches we are selling we will start to ensure that we add more and more branches and hopefully by the time the merger gets, gets consummated I think we will start to uh, have all our branches firing uh, with all the policies converged etc. Thanks thank you all the best yeah. Yeah so uh, 
the first question actually is on the slide which was which had pre approved uh, loans yeah. so there was a number which was 32 trillion yeah uh so that is sorry is that the industry size or <laughs> it is it's the potential see yeah. this is the internal customer base of pre approved offers where it gets refreshed by our credit and credit analytics team you can get to know more about it when you have your session with uh, jimmy tata and company but these are offers to our existing customers so effectively if vishal is one of the esteemed customers who is a part of that he will get a loan in 10 second flat that's the opportunity so it's all about how we marry this particular offers with our sales process i know there's a you know as we start to improve upon our um analytics the fact that we try and you know zero in on when there is a need of a product when we are able to identify the moment of truth i think you will start to see a lot of unleashing but that's an opportunity for the frontline people to be able to sell whether it's a branch whether it's the virtual relationship management team whether it's the lot of other frontline team who can sort of harness this data in front of their crm systems in fact we should going forward yeah Uh, that's the opportunity where you have going forward that you have also the mortgage product added in there as a pre approved for example vishal should be having a pre approved mortgage offer this includes that but no. this is based on income because this is like 2x of current industry size of this four products yes vishal the, it's a lot of attractive opportunity that is there it's a massive opportunity just the moment you start to marry that with um, need based selling or when there is a need for the customer just imagine the power that's the potential which is there great great that's great and the other question is on on the tech and digital channels yeah so while clearly the focus would be on on physical you know expansion uh, uh i'm sure you know i think you also you know we've discussed this in past also that how digital uh, offering is now become a me too offering and almost all banks have caught up all right uh so now now for example to keep gaining market share especially from the metro and and urban areas you will still need a top notch digital offering uh there was a delay or lag in in the upgrades now when do we start seeing you know like hdfc bank being once again number one on digital you know channels thank you for that yeah number one is let me just correct this impression that uh there's nothing wrong with our technology i think we over 27 years we had uh we've always done a lot of global first um and the events that have caused us to have a different impression on you all is uh, not necessarily technology you can but we probably sort of uh, humbly accept whatever was the verdict given and we have put in a we've used our opportunity to reimagine our technology rails number 1 number 2 is i think when we in 2015 when we launched uh, the digital 1.0 i think the kind of products that we have launched uh is unparalleled even today uh today like the 10 second person loans or the 10 second auto loans or the 10 second two wheeler loans or do your own login again securities or your instant uh, you know uh, merchant loans or uh, loan against property as well a lot of other things and today you know when you look at the cost to earnings at that point in time we were about 49% so today when you look at the kind of digital disbursals that have come in through these kind of uh, you know pre qualified pre approved loans it's one of the reasons why that has brought down the cost to earnings from a 49% to a 39% until march of 2020 so we have been ahead of curve on that one yes you know the kind of incidents that have happened in november 2018 a day in december 2019 the data center issue in november 2020 obviously 
uh, has had an impact from a reputation perspective. We have used that opportunity to lay the rails differently now. We are moving. Uh, you can have uh, you know, the head of technology sort of wax eloquent on that, but in a very simple layman terms, we have been using, uh, we created two factories. One is the enterprise factory whose main job was to try and have the applications move out of create microservices out of the monolithic architecture, put them in containers and then put them in cloud so that the scalability and resiliency of, uh, of the architecture is now going to be uh, not an issue going forward. We will never have issues on scale, we will never have issues on you know, uh, a certain aspect of the application coming down because you will have redundancies and you will have failover mechanisms on an active active basis. It is an important one. It is not visible to you all but that is a rail that we had to put in place which is a strategy that we said that we will start off from the core layer. We have now digital factories which is now going to be coming out with products on the engagement layer. But in July and September you will get the actual uh, dates from our team. You will be surprised by the kind of products that we will be launching, unleashing. Even now as late as last week or two weeks ago we launched something called the express loans which is there which is a global first. I mean you know you go to walk into a dealer and you get a 30, uh, an auto loan new to bank customer not just an existing. Whilst we have 10 second loans but even a non uh, pre approved customer getting a loan in 30 minutes at a dealership cre has created a flutter in this industry because it is a global first and you know it is not easy but you had to do a lot of engineering in the background to be able to offer that. You will now start to see right from uh, July to September various launches whether it is the fact that we have partnered with Adobe on all our journeys about 30 hour journeys that is what I believe but uh, I am sure when you have the further presentations down they will tell you what are the kind of journeys which will be game changing whether it is on the liability side, whether it is on the asset side, whether it is on the uh, investment side hopefully. <coughs> you will start we, we have launched people do not know about it we have launched something an application which is a smart hub application for the merchants. Uh, it is called the Vyapar first probably I think that is a name that is given out there. We have already done about three and a uh, how many uh, million? Um, a million but uh, uh, you Parag will probably sort of uh, mention that uh, but silently we have done about 300,000 odd if I if, if my memory serves right or 350,000 merchants. Now, what does it do? This is equivalent to an Alipay, an offline online, online offline mode, wherein here you are at the center of the application, you are the payment facilitator, you are uh, you, the form factors are agnostic, whether it is a card, whether it is an UPI, whether it is a QR code, whether it is tap and pay, you are there. You, you can allow customers to do any forms of payment. You have an application provider who sort of provides value added services like accounting services for the merchant which is also ex extremely important now in this age in terms of providing for GST accounting etc. And then look at it the merchant has lot of catchments you go to a small town you have a main street you have a loyal about 5000 to 10,000 customers who are always coming to that center street in that particular small town for, for, a, for the weekly uh, uh, purchases. Now you can now use this particular application to be able to engage with these uh, uh, customers and households through various form factors including a WhatsApp and you are they can order and they can deliver and they can make the payments there and so on. So <clears throat> and they can market their products. So that is a kind of a uh, application which is gaining ground. We as I said this is one we are now 3 million customer uh, merchants. We will be 20 million merchants in about 3 years time. Uh, even if Parag does not have this vision now he has a vision now have to do that. But a lot of launches that will happen. The most important is going to be our payment app. It is going to be I believe something that we will be all proud of. Uh, it will be better than a Google pay and a phone pay. 
it will be self fulfilling it will be ensuring that we will be able to expose all our banking APIs on that. So it, it will be also uh, you know a payment app with a ability to do mobile banking. Um, so it is a failover from you know even if the mobile is down mobile app is down you can continue to use that. This is going to be a game changer I do not want to talk too much about it I will let uh, the technology and digital teams talk about this. But uh, when it gets launched between July and September I think we will get back our mojo as you are saying. Thank you all the best. Yeah uh, so two three questions on uh, PSL. So firstly the PSLC you know purchase that we have done on the net basis uh, till FI21 uh, you know the number has increased to around 82,000 crore and uh, it is one of the highest number as a percentage to A and B C as like you know in the peer group. So that is uh, one that how it is you know going to pan out you know when we have a merger with uh, SDFC limited and where would it help whether uh, it would help in a uh, small marginal farmer section or uh, maybe some other section. So that is one second uh, if you look at you know RIDF uh, you know bond that we have that is also you know kind of around uh, 9000 crore number and uh, total cost on uh, PNL is close to 100 bips of uh, PPOP. So how things are going to pan out uh, post merger thanks. No see that is uh, one of the key areas of focus for us okay. Now as I mentioned in the previous conversation out here it is a cost that we will have to factor it in if we are not able to meet our own organic priority sector. Now we are putting in all our levers to ensure that we are um, it, uh, you know trying to see how to meet our priority sector on our own but there will be it is I mean let us be realistic about it sometimes the small and marginal farmer or the weaker section will take some time because there is a lot of risk involved in doing that. But if you start to bundle this with the gold loans part of it maybe to some extent it will alleviate and we will have to see this slowly grow by. So in our business model as it is today there is a certain cost which is embedded in, the, in our profitability. You know the amount unfortunately is smaller because what happens is when you do an organic priority sector the ROAs are even at as high as 3 percent. So a 3 percent ROA on a priority sector core priority sector offset by a certain amount of a cost which is ranging between 1 to 2 percent or the total requirements I think is something that we will have to embed this and we will have to keep on minimizing that going forward. It is not, no, no bank in this country other than small rural bank regional rural banks uh, which has uh, you know uh, a small balance sheet have been able to achieve the sub limits of a small and marginal farm or weaker section. But I think we believe that as we start to use our distribution for gold loans ensure that the end uses agriculture we can start to minimize this gap going forward. We will have excesses in the general priority sector because our home loans especially in semi urban rural will all qualify for priority sector that is something that you need to factor it in. I, 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 yeah why did not you say. No sir I, I think uh, while you know we have talked about am I audible. Yeah. yeah. So I think once we have talked about the fact that you know uh, there is PSLC, uh, PSLC is one <coughs> of the various avenues available. Uh, we have charted out quite a few more. It is going to be a matter of execution but are there opportunities? Most certainly. Let me give you one or two out of the bag. So if you look at what is available in co-lending. So given our tie ups with a vast segment of NBFCs the whole co-lending model based on our credit standards helps me access the small and marginal uh, and micro institutions where <coughs> I need to fill that up as well as on the agri side. So the co-lending is one model. The second model that we have again out over there is because of the higher net worth that we would have uh, we would be able and the higher priority sector we would be able to meet that by 
doing uh, by doing uh, lending for NBFCs who are allowed to further lend on the agri side. So that again helps us meet the PSL part of it. Then there is what we do PTCs and there is also securitization. So there is a host of avenues that we have chalked out. Uh, yes, PSLC is the single largest. No walking away from that and therefore we present that. But there are other avenues which we will work on and which we've already worked upon and we have to get scale in that <coughs> which will help meet the core PSL requirements. So it's just not one, there is a bouquet available. Uh, thank you. Just one related question. Like, you know, uh, like key providers of PSLC right now in the system is RRB1, PSU Bank, you know, in some of the segments and then we have uh, this, you know, SFBs. And other banks, you know, having a market share, you know, close to 90% or more. And if the 90% of the system starts, you know, growing faster, then 10% of the system, you know, cannot provide that kind of uh, PSLC required. And uh, RIDF, you know, like by all the financial institution, or whatever issuance they do and the allocation based on that, we will still have some deficit there. So, like, you know, on the larger scale, like on the larger picture, larger canvas, it is not just about SDFC Bank, like, you know, there would be a good amount of deficit that a system will still have. So, that is a larger... No, you're right. You're right. I'm not sort of disputing that when the economy opens, when because a lot of the banks' balance sheets have cleaned up, they would now like to grow. Th that's reality. But I guess, uh, you know, when you look at the overall, we'll be the largest provider of PSLCs in the market because we will be having... You know, your, you, the growth that we are talking about over the next five years is going to come in even from our priority sector as well. Our home loans in semi urban and rural will all qualify for that. So I have again mentioned this. I may fall short on um, the small and marginal farmer and weaker section, we, which is where if you don't meet, you will have to put it in our idea. So we have factored that as a cost in our uh, in our projections, which is something that is already embedded even today. So the overall requirement will be minimized because we will have so much of other PSL to sell, whether it's micro enterprises, whether it is on uh, uh, home loans, affordable home loans, will all sort of give you an, a positive fee, which will reduce the operating costs that we're talking about. But having said that, this is a challenge, but this is our execution capability. I mean, how, with like liabilities, this is another f focus area for us to see how we minimize the, uh, you know, reliance on outside of the uh, core acquisition of priority sector. We'll have to see this, but I will not give you a false picture to say that we will be completely self-sufficient. We will have a gap. It is already baked in. It's already baked in today. It will be baked in even t tomorrow. Uh, when I say that we are going to be a scale bank, when I talked about a number where we are going to be doubling in five years, it is after factoring this kind of an operating cost. Okay. Hi, Sushi over here. Some Hi, no, yeah. The other thing is at times, you know, sometimes you generate <laughs> in a particular category excess general PSL. We also are providers of selling that, that helps reduce my cost and then buying those specific subcategories. Yeah. Hi, hi, Shashi. Morning. Hi. Um, a slightly bigger picture question in terms of the merger itself again. Uh, typically, uh, when organizations such as yours, uh, so huge, when, when we get into a merger scenario, uh, the typical reaction is to slow down, take a pause, understand what are the challenges, uh, um, and ensure you get out of this uh, more stronger uh, than you enter. I'm keen to understand your thought yeah. process as to how, why you've decided to, you know, accelerate and chose to, you know, continue on the uh, same, same growth momentum. Thank you. So you're saying, uh, just uh, repeat the last one, that why, whether our bandwidth will be impacted because of this merger? Uh, the choice was to either take a pause, you know, understand all the risks associated with the merger and then get out of the merger two, three years down the line with a much stronger <coughs> balance sheet and instead we've chosen to continue with our growth momentum at this moment. Okay. 
So a couple of things number one I explained to you that here is a macro opportunity which is staring in front of you which can power not only the economy but even from a durability of growth. See when you look at the growth thus far of the bank over 27 years we have been on the shorter duration of the curve. Our average duration of our assets and liabilities has been about 1.2, 1.3 years. With home loans, you know, so you're catching your tail every 18 months to grow at about 18 to 22 percent year on year on year. Not that it's not possible, but it's a, it's a kind of a, you know, just imagine the moment you extend your duration, it sort of brings you a fair amount of ease. You know, you're able to breathe to be able to grow, so number one. So here if that is going to be powering India's economy over the next 5-7 years it will be stupid for us to miss this opportunity because I, as I explained to you there was a inhibition in that extant arrangement. You know you were there was a limitation on HDFC limited to expand its duration and let me explain to you on their behalf. Housing or home loans is an oligopoly market with an intense competition. So you had a very thin spread on home loans which all of you know. When you have this kind of a dynamics you need to ensure that the two other uh, legs of the stool had to be absolutely efficient. I think giving you have to give credit to HTAC limited for running one of the best operations. You had the lowest cost of operations nowhere no financial company no housing finance company globally runs this kind of cost of operations at less than 10 percent. You look at the asset quality he runs I am talking about pure mortgages okay. You have one of the best asset quality ever than anyone else. You know I know a lot of you in probably may have had this question that is it a 2 plus percentage ROA you will be surprised he is one of the few housing finance companies to run this I, I may be wrong maybe there are some but he has executed extremely well. Now why? Why is he executed? So look at it. So he had to maintain the two stools of the, the two legs of the stool very tight. One was the cost of operations. Therefore he limited himself to 35 hubs and 600 odd branches which is ne necessary for him to maintain the low cost of operations. He had to ensure that he chooses the collateral in terms of only the top 100 towns it could be a uh, Delhi, Mumbai, Jaipur, Chandigarh etc. You know he never sort of opened up beyond uh, municipal agreements. So there was a reason there was a finite capacity on a large NBFC in terms of funding there is a there is a compulsion on profitability where he had to maintain tighter cost of operations so that is why he, he had a uh, etc. Now here is an opportunity which is staring in front of us wherein now when you open it up. <coughs> It ex this explains as to why only one third of our branches were selling home loans. You know where the branch our branch distribution is already sunk. So the marginal cost that will happen only because of home loans is going to be much lesser. As I said with 220 basis points of cost differential cost of fund differential even if I were to increase this distribution cost or this credit cost in or the sales cost to you know the pre credit verification cost as, as you call it we are all right because we still have a massive amount of a differential that will accrue to this. Now why would anyone any organization miss out this opportunity mind you you uh, let me uh, preempt one of the questions you may say that why is it that you did not do it on your own why could not you build your own uh, home loan book. See mind you you know if we did not merge if since economics said that it is better to merge if we did not do it. The, a large NBFC such as HDFC would have had to integrate with someone else with another bank which means that we would have lost the brand and the brand of HDFC bank is extremely important for us. So it was no point just trying to say thank you and start your own we could have done that but it was not making sense here is a company which has excelled in 42 years which is something a product which is well reputed we just want to lift and shift here and then distribute it that is the objective here is a once in a lifetime opportunity for the organization to scale it without 
uh, with all the metrics remaining intact as I had just mentioned. Thank you. Yeah. Sashi over here. Uh, yeah, two yeah. questions. Uh, one basically that uh, HDFC Bank and HDFC Limited both have been on the road to meet investors, shareholders as such. Any dissent uh, that you saw from the investors? No. If yes, no. how do you plan to address? No. So yes, so we started off very late. We, as you know, the announcement was 4th of April. We had a short period until 17th. It's only after that that we started to meet investors. You know, we prefer to do one-on-one. -on -one. We've covered about out of the 10 geographies, two geographies. Thus far, I think when you explain the rationale, our story about the merger, I think it's, uh, it's been positive thus far. Second question is about the regulator. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what it basically could be the plan B if basically uh, the regulator doesn't allow you to increase a stake in the insurance to 50 percent? No, no. Uh, similarly, for HDB financial services, I think you have seek permission to keep yeah. it as a separate subsidiary. So, couple of things. One of the asks, see, the the merger of this scale, obviously before we announced had the blessings of the regulator, uh, the Ministry of Finance and the in principle. I mean it is not that they are going to give you in writing, they are saying yes and, and even the Prime Minister's office. So that is number one. Number two is the ask that we have asked the regulator is that we want a simple <coughs> A plus B merger where HDFC bank will be the holding company. <coughs> Two is one of the ask is that like you have in a lot of other banks, a large uh, PSU bank and two other private sector banks where you they have allowed the subsidies to be the subsidies of these banks. We have said that allow similar kind of a uh, structure even for uh, below the bank. When you talk about specifics, when it comes to the investment in HDFC Life and HDFC Ergo. Our preference and our ask is that can you allow us to go to that extra 50, you know, the 2.5% in uh, HDFC Life, Life 2, 2 .2 and 0.2% in HDFC Ergo so that we cross the 50 plus. You would wonder why. I think whether you like it or not, one of the biggest beneficiaries of this particular merger are going to be the subsidiaries as well, whether it is HDFC AMC, whether it is uh, HDFC Life, whether it is HDFC Ergo. Now, I am still saying we will patronize open architecture, but having said that hitherto we were just a distributor. Now, we will be a parent child relationship, so there will be a little bit of a soft corner for these child entities. So, the opportunity that these entities will have in harnessing our distribution heft, our customer heft is going to be unimaginable. So, our preference would be that, but in the worst case scenario if the cabin pressure were to say that no, you have to drop it to 30 percent, we are all right, we still will uh, you know would want to juice out even at 30 percent the subsidiaries. Uh, uh, opportunity in this kind of a new entity. Last is on HDB finance and HDB credit line. Obviously, we await directions from the, uh, from the regulator. Uh, <clears throat> we are open. It is a financial investment for both and if there is a need for us to have a glide path downwards, we are going to happily do that. If at all, we, we, we are directed to do it. We will set it up in our own stable. So, we are not overly concerned. I think we will monetize that and sort of reuse it for reinvestments, which is a huge amount of opportunity that is there. Now that we are a large holding company, we will have a lot of opportunities to invest in technology companies below. So, we are quite excited about any possibility that may arise out of that. Thanks. Sure. So, just uh, extending on that uh, question, what would be the plan if RBI does not accept the way uh, the structure has been in the current form? No. See, so the, the, the structure that we have applied for is a simple A plus B structure, which is the structure that has been asked by the regulator to apply. 
So I know where you are coming in from, I, you are talking about whether it will become a non-holding, uh, what is it called, NOF, non-operating yeah, non 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 -operating non -operating holding, holding company structure, no that is not, it is whilst it may have find its literature in the discussion paper of the interworking group, uh, as of now since the tax neutrality is not resolved, the regulator is very clear, keep it simple keep just A plus B with HDFC bank becoming the whole co, that is it. We are going to be an operating company as well and there is no confusion about it. And that is how we have applied because that is how we have been asked to apply. Okay, but in case it is allowed like they say that okay only HDFC's mortgage business can be done with HDFC bank and others have to be a separate entity. No, that is not as I said again I am trying to reiterate that. That is not the structure that we have applied, that is the structure that we have been asked, the way we have, been, we have applied is the way the regulators asked us to do it. Okay. So there is no ambiguity on that at all. If at all the tax neutrality status changes, then obviously it will not be just for HDFC bank, it will be for the system. the system, banking system as such, all the other entities. When that happens, we will think about a structure, I mean which is, uh, which economic sense. Sure. And uh, the other question is with respect to the group entities, what are the synergies that you would see? You said, uh, you definitely said that the relationship would change now, but in terms of the fee income distribution and all, yeah. what is the kind of uh, uptake which we can see from there besides the uh, home loans? Yeah. See, look, you know like any parent child relationship, you will have a soft corner. You will provide access, not that uh, you are not going to provide access to others. But obviously, you know, the, the power of the combined entity is now is something that it is important for us to harness because ultimately their value goes up and comes in, in the value in the sum of parts. So it, we have a direct bearing on that at this juncture. Until now, we were just a mere distributor. So uh, in the last couple of trips that I have had, I have carried the AMC, the Life, the Ergo and HD limited and the opportunity is eye popping. You know in terms of our own distribution whether it is this distribution whether the alternate banking channel distribution whether it is the, the engagement virtual relationship management platform that we are talking about. The fact that now we had not thought about it but then even uh, I am sure you know this is a I, I do not know whether our technology and digital teams will be thinking but now it is something that they can have consume the APIs of all the um, of all the group entities and the power of that combined entity can be unleashed even in our digital platforms. So the opportunities are galore obviously you know the bonus of all this merger is the fact that you will start to we as an entity will continue to get fee income uh, probably higher fee income and they will also have an underlying. Uh, uh, run a uh, larger and a stronger run on their underlying sales which should sort of lead to higher value which will sort of be uploaded through the sum of parts to us. Sure, thanks. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, so my question is on the uh, wholesale side, uh, this side. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so last couple of years you have seen uh, strong growth on that front probably also on the commercial banking side. Uh, where would you be in terms of the wallet share of some of your top customers um, and how much more you think uh, to go in terms of opportunity? Kaiser. Okay, so I think the presentation that comes up soon after this will give you more insights so I will not take away the thunder of Nirav's when he presents. Uh, but I think uh, we, do, we do map the wallet share. The growth in the wallet share and we do believe that we are in most of our relationships amongst the top two banks. It is not only a question of uh, the funding that we provide, it is also the entire gamut and bouquet of services including your entire trade and transaction banking and treasury products. Uh, with the higher net worth that we would have, it would give us an opportunity in certain groups to increase and step up our engagement and that would also bring in a much more diversity of our offerings within the group. 
So on the wholesale side, I think you know this provides us with tremendous uh, growth path, and that is that is something that we've already kind of uh, mapped. And as the merger comes through, we will be able to quickly grab those opportunities which you know today are there, but we are limited because of certain uh, limits or restrictions that we have to work with. So. We are, we are waiting keenly to see how that unfolds. But uh, I mean some of the growth that we have seen in last say 24 to 36 months would also be a function of the fact that competition probably was not growing and you were, uh, you had a classic funding advantage as well. So you could cherry pick at, at your risk. Uh, is there a, a cap that would come at some point in time? No, so if I uh, got your question right, you know, how do we deal with competition? I think, you know, if you go back and see 27 years of HDFC bank, the first five was only wholesale bank. We didn't have a retail bank till 99, 2000. And thereafter, I think we've dealt with competition, whether it has been the aggression of a few PSU banks or sometimes uh, other private sector banks. I think we've, we've learned to deal with competition and that really is not something that alters our journey. Uh, this is something that is inbuilt into the journeys that we've had. So we don't see that as a challenge, but yes, we have to respond to that. We have to align to that, which we continuously do as we you know, go to achieve. And as the slide out over there showed, uh, if uh, Shini, we could go to the slide of market share, I think that uh, numbers itself, uh, you know, reflect what we have done over the last one, three and five years. So if you see HDFC Bank's market share on the advances as against top three peers combined, I think that, that data speaks for itself in terms of competition and the opportunity that is there. And we feel confident that we should be able to continue that journey. Yeah. And just finally on the fees bit, uh, the wholesale fees probably has reduced to uh, single digits of the total pie. Uh, while we say that uh, entire wholesale growth is not just balance sheet driven, uh, how does one kind of explain this dichotomy? No, so it's not, uh, so if you see, you know, as Shashi was explaining earlier, in wholesale, whereas, you know, you will have a lower NII compared to retail, the cost of wholesale as well as the credit costs and add to that what wholesale brings and you'll see it in a, the next presentation, the complete transaction banking income, the complete cash management income, the complete cross sell on salaries and the complete FX income that brings with the corporate lending is a fairly good piece of the overall and therefore leading to a better ROA. So that is very much there and I think we had a slide which showed out over there that you know in the two years when we slowed down retail, we were able to step up wholesale and whilst we did that, your ROA has yet continued to be at a bank wide level at 2%. So it's not, it's not just pure lending, that's not been our philosophy. We don't go and lend to any customer and say okay that's how we will grow the asset book because let's say at times I have the benefit of more competitively priced liability. <coughs> That's never been our model. Our model is how do we ensure that we have the complete banking products and solutions to the corporate, which very simplistically means I will not only be a provider of funds, but I will be a provider of the entire banking services, which includes your complete trade non-fund, FX, cash, dividend, tax, salary, and I can bore you with the list. But that is what we do and that's how we manage life cycle of each and every customer on the wholesale side, whether he's an SME, whether he's an emerging corporate or he's a corporate banking customer. And that's been our <coughs> entire model and that's what keeps the engagement going. That's what gives you to improve, <coughs> as someone else asked, the share of wallet. That's what helps you get in more products to your existing uh, corporates. And let's understand, 
the quality of the corporates that we deal with, they themselves grow every year between 15 to 20 percent. So apart from that, you have the other opportunities which we will cover later on. So we do see fees, commission, FX as important components of the wholesale banking ladder. Uh, one, one thing I want to add for you is that uh, when you mentioned about the fees being uh, composition is in single digit, yeah. uh, you're not including FX uh, because we report FX outside of fees, uh, uh, which is a significant component in wholesale. So that's something that you want to take into account. Uh, and the <coughs> other aspect that Kaiser alluded to is the benefits that come on various other uh, activities. They are all in the interest income itself, right? Uh, uh, every other activity provides uh, uh, earnings on the interest in the form of a float or in the form of uh, uh, balances that are there or in so any other manner that is coming in the interest line. Thanks. And, and, and the corporate business is a feeder to the retail business because as you mentioned, we are the largest salary banker. Right. And then when you look at the, the advantages of the salary business, whether you you know, large part of the pre-approved offers will all be in the salaried business, etc. So it's a huge, you know, feeder to that business, and so it sort of feeds on itself. One, one thing that uh, we don't have it here today, but at some point in time we will start talking is the self-funding in the in the wholesale corporate bank. Yeah. That self-funding is quite high, 70, 80 percent. That is the balances that come from those organizations. <laughs> plus the retail customers Sorry. providing the liability balances uh, uh, to the bank and so you have to look at it holistically that relationship brings what sort of liabilities for the bank in total. Sure. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this one will be the last final question. Yeah. Yeah, I think Mahesh. Sajji. Uh, just two questions. One, uh, at a time when we see, uh, you know, the, the concept of manufacturing versus distribution, uh, how important is the investments that you think you would have in your subsidiaries once this merger is completed? <coughs> or uh, let me phrase it another way. How important is it for you to own these subsidiaries? See, frankly, if you ask me on this one, you look at the existing extant structure. <clears throat> the extant structure was a, was a nice whole core for the subsidiaries, but it was not able to provide that uh, opening for them to really, dis, you know, to sort of uh, have a larger distribution. They had to rely on an associate company called HDFC Bank. But the moment it now comes in, the fact, the reality is that. HTAC Life is uh, listed, HTAC AMC is listed and I know that the similar kind of a whole code discounts will sort of flow through uh, in value. But all things remaining same, the, re the fact that now as I mentioned earlier on, we will be exposing the subsidiaries to a larger distribution heft, larger <coughs> customer uh, uh, access with of course within the uh, within the four corners of data security and data privacy norms I think is a massive opportunity which we have n not even tapped thus far. So as I again uh, the cost of repetition I would love to have it anything beyond 50 percent because then we can juice out the sum of parts slightly higher. But even if uh, we were to say that go down to 30 percent so be it but still the 30 percent on the value that we will now bring to the subsidy companies is going to be much larger than what it is today. So therefore, I am not going to probably push ourselves to increase any further investment other than the small one just to tip over to the uh, 50 percent mark. But if for whatever reason the regulator says that no, uh, the law of the land says that you are going to pair it down to 30 percent, so be it, we are okay. Perfect. Uh, my second question is, in the past, uh, HDFC has kind of liked to work on an ecosystem of its own. You have seen your Pays app, your Smart Buy and so on and so forth. Uh, in an era where we have these open ecosystems kind of building, uh, how comfortable are you today to explore that's, that part of it as compared to what you have done in the past? 
So, just give me an example. The, the Pays app and your yeah. Smart Buy essentially right. are ecosystems where you want the customer to come to your uh, to your place to work. Whereas we have seen in a, in the market at least customers preferring to kind of open up with the bank on the website of the merchant. So we've seen in the past that you've always enjoyed having that control on the customer. See, there are two parts to it. Number one is, you know, <clears throat> banking as a service, where we expose our APIs on platforms where there's a large number of footfalls is something that we, we would like to harness. It's going to be a new channel. It's something that we have started out with some of the tech companies like Paytm. We're doing a lot of experiments there. So why not? What is it? You're just having an access. They're all distributors. You're having a larger access of customers, and it's another channel. So why not have that access? So that's part one. Part two is the kind of technology that now we are going to be building on. It's going to be a completely new stack, and the tech and digital team will sort of talk about it on what we're now trying to create on the Pays app or whatever is the name that they'll come out with is akin to where like a Disney, I mean I'm sure, I mean this is something that I sort of resonated beautifully. Earlier on Netflix was a distributor. He used to distribute Disney um, products. But now Disney later on I believe realized that hey we are the content provider, we should also be the distribution. We are probably in that kind of space today. We have the content, we have all the necessary uh, products to be exposed to our customers. We manufacture all of them out here. So we are saying that why should I have to rely on a third party for content? We have the content, we will distribute it. So this is another separate uh, you know, ecosystem that we are creating. So this is going to be a very important aspect of this. This is going to be the differentiator vis-a-vis -vis what uh, uh, a Google Pay or a phone pay is going to do because we are going to be manufacturing. They are going to be partnering with third party financiers whereas we are going to have our own products manufactured too which is what uh, akin to a Disney, uh, uh, what Disney is doing now. So this is a thought process but having said that as I mentioned we have a separate strategy on banking as a service where we will be exposing a lot of our APIs trying to see whether we can have the incremental uh, advantage by the uh, the so-called uh, you know riding on the I think the Okan rails on the A uh, rails uh, hopefully by then, which will sort of give us the uh, some additional information about the customer from that particular platform. So we're going to have have this as two separate strategies. We are okay to have the Pays app as a, a independent e ecosystem exactly what I talked about from a Disney kind of uh, example and we will have the banking as a service as a new channel which we will sort of test it out with a lot of our, our partnerships and as we see if the distribution increases why not. Thank you I, I guess that was the, that was the last. Uh, so just to session. summarize I mean thank you so much for coming over here I think here you know HDFC Bank which is executed so well over 27 years is now at an inflection point where scale is not it's going to be a scale game growth is not an opportunity it's going to be pouring out of the years the only limiting factor is liabilities and we have a execution strategy to ensure that our liabilities are enough to cover uh, 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 the kind of growth that's going to come in we are virtually we are now as I said even ex mortgages all our uh, segments whether it's corporate whether it's the SME seg segment whether it's the retail segment has started to fire. Surely some of the products you will see a bit of a lag basis because of the fact that A uh, like the auto and vehicle loans there's a semiconductor uh, issue so the underlying sales are down so you will see that a little bit tepid but even otherwise you know from a year on year perspective since the duration are short as we start to increase our disbursals which will be over uh, which will be higher than the repayments then you will start to see the book grow. The mix will change in, uh, into the normalized levels that we have seen in the past but it will take some time. But we are not apologetic to have a higher corporate uh, mix as well. As I said 
it's, it's a high ROA and a high ROE product, so why should I be so worried about it at all? The, <coughs> the, the priority for us is to ensure that we have a wholesome growth over the next uh, uh, several years. We will be expanding our distribution. You will see a lot of things that are happening, whether it is in the brand channel itself in terms of expanding our distribution, the fact that you have an alternative banking channel which you will start to talk about it in terms of see them, in terms of how we are going to be covering different parts of the uh, country through the hub and spoke model or whether it is the engagement layer that is the management program. Between the branch relationship ma management program, between the private banking, between the virtual relationship management program, you will see the differential that you know people keep talking about fintechs. It is a cold uh, channel. The, the fintechs are cold. We are going to be human. We are going to be human. We are going to have a lot of engagement. We are going to be giving respect to the customers. Ultimately, that is going to be a differentiating factor out here. Our, uh, the growth engines, the SME business is a huge amount of opportunity. But of course, we will do it with only if it makes economic sense. We are not going to go down the risk ladder. We are not going to go down the pricing ladder, both for corporate and SME as well. So the opportunity to grow is huge. The housing, the home loan merger announcement as and when it gets consummated is going to just overlay the, the growth duration. We had a runway of 20, 30 years. Now I think we will have a runway of 50, 100 years. The dur durability or the quality of growth is going to be very good because your durations are going to be extended. We, the, the, as the cost of operations is going to be lower, the cost of credit is going to be lower. The, the scale at which we are going to be growing because just, just imagine when one of the, present, one of the slides had said that 2%. That today it's an emotional product. The, you know, going from a two to a seven virtually doubles the bank. Seven to twelve further. So the opportunity double an emotional product, a sticky product, and product that is so easy to sell at the front end, which has multiple such uh, uh, avenues. You know, whether it is liability franchise, whether the cross bundling of consumer durable loans, whether it is the fact that your runway for unsecured loans just increases, is going to be a heady factor. So we are extremely excited about the future. Yes, it, as always, the only risk that we run is an execution risk. That is our responsibility and that is something that we have demonstrated for 27 years. We believe we can do it over the next many years. The institution is absolutely geared. It is exciting uh, in terms of what the scale it provides. So thank you very much for this uh, uh, conversation with you all. Thank you. Thank you, sirs. Uh, ladies you. and gentlemen, we have reached the end of first session. Now we will have a short break of 15 minutes. Thank you so much.